be out of here by 9. <laughs> Bad news is you are not going to be out of here by 8.30 unless you choose to leave by 8.30. That would be totally up to you, and I would understand. Some of you have a bedtime. I understand that. Um, I went back and I looked at my slides and I said, man, is there anything I can cut out here? And the answer is no. Um, but I'm going to go through it really fast through the first four points, and then I'm going to slow down on the fifth point because it's the most important one. Well, that's going to make you not listen to the first four, but it's, it's my favorite point, and I, I can't wait to share it with you. I'm literally jumping out of my skin. By the way, Jamie might mention this. Oh, I was going to do the little drawing, but I'll do that later. Do that later. We don't have time. You guys don't know the answers anyway. Um, um, oh, so tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, tomorrow there is no meeting tomorrow evening. Tomorrow evening's meeting is tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock right here in this facility. So I don't know if you're a member of this local church. If you are, you're welcome to come to your own home church. Isn't that nice? The visitor inviting you to come to your own home church. And if you're not, then you can play hooky on your home church uh, and come here. And if you don't normally go to church on Saturday and you typically go to church on Sunday, well then, hey, you, you're free. <laughs> you're free. So, so we'll be here tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, and I'm going to talk about five good reasons to doubt Darwin. And then 11 o'clock, I'm going to tell you five good answers to the question of suffering. And so we're going to go now to five good reasons to believe that God is good. We spent our first um, time, first session, just over an hour, on how uh, reasons to believe that God is good, or God exists, rather, five good reasons to believe God exists. And now we transition from his mere existence to his character. Well, okay, so he exists. Who is he? What is he? Is he good? And if so, how do we know that? And I'm going to give you five good reasons to believe that God is good. All right, so let's uh, have a quick prayer and we'll dive in. Father in heaven, great to be here with these beautiful people, Lord. I just, I feel a real energy in this room, a happiness in this room. And um, thank you for this little snack that we got here in the break. And be with us now, Father. May our brains be energized for a good 40 minutes of really power-packed, biblically-based, spirit-filled instruction. And I'm looking to you and, le and leaning on you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, here we go. Five good reasons to believe, is that plugged in? To believe that God is good. All right, reason number one. By the way, do you love that picture? Can you see that picture? The projector, the, the, the screens don't really do it justice, but let me tell you about that picture very briefly. I took that picture in the most beautiful place I have ever been. Does anybody know where that is? I'd be amazed if somebody knew. It is not New Zealand, but that is the second most beautiful place in the world. It was the most beautiful place in the world, in my opinion, right up until I went to this place. Um, let me see if I can give... No, nobody's going to know where this is. Okay. This is a place... Called, let me tell you a story about this place. The youngest man, the youngest person that ever has been to every country in the world... He just recently completed his journey. He did it by the time he was 28 or something like that, or 32. He's very young. And he'd been to every country in the world. And I read an interview with him, and they asked him, what was the most, what was your favorite place or the most beautiful place you went to? And he said, Lord Howe Island. And that's what you're looking at right there. Lord Howe Island is an island about an hour and a half flight off the coast, the east coast of Australia. And it is astonishingly beautiful by all means possible, get there before you die, if possible. If not, I think heaven's going to be better, but maybe not by much, because it's pretty awesome. Okay, so anyway, reason number one to believe that God is good is He created the universe, and He created our world, and He made them really good. Scripture says these words again and again and again in Genesis chapter 1, and God saw that it was good, 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 and then it closes Genesis 1, 31 with these words, then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now, if I say that something's good because I am a fallen human being who has a compromised standard of goodness, it may not be good by your standard. Um, I might hear a song and say, that's a really good standard, but you might be a professional musician and think that my song is not a good song. Or I might see a painting and think, hey, that's a really good painting, but you might be a, a very talented painter and look at the painting that I think is a good painting and say, that's not a good painting. So my standard of goodness is compromised and qualified by the person that I am. God's standard of goodness, though, is infinite, and it is infinitely perfect. So if God says something is 
very good, that means it is astonishingly good by our standards. And so in the beginning when God created, he made the universe and the world very good. So let me just talk to you a little bit about so much of the good that is in the world today. First of all, companionship and friendship, right? These are two things that, that we easily take for granted because we were born into a social reality. We take a social reality for granted. But the truth of the matter is, is that when you, you step back and just think about the nature and the beauty of having a best friend or close friends or a circle of friends or for those of us that are fortunate enough to have a spousal companion that we regard as our second self, some people say, oh, my wife is my best friend. I, I feel like, the, or my husband is my best friend. I feel like the language best friend falls so short of the nature of the relationship that I have with my spouse. She is not my best friend. She is so much more than a best friend. She's my second self. She knows where my wallet is when I don't know where my wallet is. She knows what I'm trying to say when I don't know what I'm trying to say. You know, she, she is the mirror image of me. She is strong in all the places that I am weak, and she's weak in some of the places that I am strong. Together, we, we fit together in a synergistic synchronistic way that is indescribable. Truly, in Genesis 1 and 2, God said everything was good, 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 but he said there was one thing that was not good, and he said it is not good that man should be alone. And if you are fortunate enough or blessed enough to be in one of those marriages where you're not just surviving, you're not just in an economic relationship with somebody that you share a bed with and occasionally, you know, you negotiate terms, but you really have a connection with that partner, this is a beautiful gift. It can be, that's all it can be described at as is a gift, a gift from God himself. If you don't have that, hey, listen, certainly you have friends, companions, associates. It's a beautiful thing, and we're surrounded by it, and we take it for granted. We don't all take it for granted, but it's easy to take it for granted. That's probably the better thing to say. The second one here is love and sex. What a, what a fascinating reality that exists. There is no, probably no, um, higher physical uh, sensation that the human being can experience. And in a wonderful act of, of grace, God made the life-giving act also the most pleasurable act that a human being can engage in, which is really remarkable when you think about it, because God could have made the act by which children are brought into the world like a handshake, Right? I mean, I mean that, that's an option available to him. So it, it could have been like, hey, would you like to have a child? Well, you know, yeah. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> okay, all right. You know, let's, let's wait and see if you get pregnant. No. God, God did this really cool, really amazing thing. And it's something that, that we, because we are not only social beings, we're social sexual beings, it's something that's very easy to take for granted. That, that the life-giving act is the, arguably the single most pleasurable act that a human being can participate in. And that's with great intentionality. It's purposeful that God said, hey, listen, I am the creator. I am the giver of life. And I am the creator of pleasure. And I'm going to blend creation and pleasure together in this remarkable, amazing thing that we know as human sexuality which then results in something else that's absolutely amazing, babies. Am I wrong or am I right? Is there anything that is small and young and cute? Is there anything that's like in its baby form that's not cute? Right? I mean, almost everything, little baby owls look amazing. Little baby seals look amazing. You know, how many of us have been lured into bringing a kitten home? Right? And we just forget that the problem with kittens is that they turn into cats, right? And... <laughs> And, I mean, babies, babies are cute, and little kittens are cute, and little puppies are cute, right? It was just, there's so much goodness in the world, and not just babies, but children. I tell you, one of the joys in my life are my two boys. And I think part of the reason for that is I've given a lot of thought to why children bring such joy to their parents. And, you know, not always joy, but let's be honest. Um, I think the number one reason is this, at least this is what it is for me, I feel like with my sons, my two boys, and I wished I would have had a little girl. In fact, I'll tell you a cute little story. I'm begging my wife. She just turned 40, and I told her, baby, 40's the new 30. Let's do this. <laughs> and, and I'm just begging her to have a child, a little girl. And, uh, and she's just not having any of it. But I'm, just, hey, I'm still working the angles. I'm like, hey, listen, let's do this. Working. She's not feeling. But anyway, here's the point. So she and I text back and forth while I'm here in America. She's in Australia. And my son got onto my computer, which also has texts. And he texted me last night, sweetheart, let's make a baby, a little girl. And I was like, I texted her last night. I was like, yes, let's do it. 
This will be great. Then I woke up this morning, was going throughout my day. My wife wakes up. She reads her text. She's like, hey, that last text? I'm like, yes. She's like, Landon sent that. <laughs> That's my son. That's my son. So anyway, anyway, so here's my point. Here's my point. That wasn't even my point. Just a cute little story. The point is, is that the great thing about children is you get to live your life over again. You get to catch a ball for the first time. You get to take a step for the first time. You get to see a hippopotamus for the first time. You get to see a giraffe for the first time. You get to go swimming for the first time. You, you get to go ice skating again for the first time. You get to live your life vicariously through your children. And I'm told, though I don't yet know this experientially, that it's, it's almost better with your grandchildren because you get to send them home. You get to have all of those great experiences and then send them home, right? Okay, here's another one. Mangoes, blueberries, and peaches. I mean, are you kidding me? Really? I mean, food. Just think of the taste of a mango or of blueberries. I mean, life is good. The simple pleasures, right? Even if your whole world is falling apart, go down to the store, buy some fresh blueberries, and eat them. Your life will get better, <laughs> right? If only momentarily, it will be better. Or if you can get your hands on a good mango, which is next to impossible in the United States of America. But if you come to Australia, you can get them. They grow in our yard, by the way. We have five mango trees. I know, it's terrible. And we're just coming into mango season right when I get back. I know, you feel sorry for me. But anyway, <laughs> you can come visit. But if you ever can just get your hand on a mango, even if you're in the deepest of depressions, just, just take a few bites. And at least for that moment, you'll be like, life is good. God is good, life is good, the little pleasures. And finally here, music. How many people out there would rate music as very important to your life? Very important. Yeah, me too. And, and there are just certain emotions that you feel, especially for those of you that are music lovers, that you cannot feel under any other stimulus. It not, I mean, reading can produce a certain kind of feeling, and poetry produces another, and uh, blueberries produce another, and lovemaking produces another, and children produce another, but there is something that music does that nothing else can do. And I've, I've been fascinated by music for years, and uh, read a book a number of years ago called This Is Your Brain on Music. Fascinating book, by the way. And there is just, we are wired to appreciate music, melody, and rhythm, and harmony. And so we are surrounded by so much goodness. But the list doesn't stop there. How about this one? Indian food. Yeah? Who else out there is feeling the goodness of God in Indian food? All of the textures and the flavors and the curries. Yes! And how about Thai food? Anybody else out there? By the way, this is my order. This is the order of preference. So Indian, Thai food, yes? Are you kidding me? Masaman curry, Tom Kha soup. I mean, stop it. Mediterranean food, any tabbouleh lovers out there? Majadra, falafel, come on. Are you kidding? Italian food? Good Italian food? I'm not talking about just spaghetti with sauce. I'm talking about good Italian food. Do you love it? And McDonald's. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I put that up there. Okay, so there's just so much good in the world. Now, C.S. Lewis says, creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for these desires exists. A baby feels hunger. Well, there is such a thing as food. Watch this. It's a very persuasive line of reasoning. A duckling wants to swim. Well, there is such a thing as water. Men, and presumably women, feel sexual desire. And there is such a thing as sex. Now, watch this. If, however, I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Now, follow his line of reasoning because it's brilliant. For every desire you have, there is the resolution of that desire. Right? You're hungry, there is food. You want water, you're thirsty, there is uh, liquid to, to, to slake your thirst. You, you want to, you, 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 duckling wants to swim. There you go. Men, want to, men and women want to have sexual interaction. They're all, for every desire that we have, there is the potential resolution of that desire. But Lewis says, but wait a minute. What if I have in some difficult to describe part of me this yearning, this hungering, this desire that no experience on this earth can satisfy, he says the best explanation is that I was made for another world, a better world, a world that God himself would call very good. Now, the world that we live in here is a very good world, but it's a world that's been largely compromised. And we're going to talk about the nature of that compromise tomorrow in our second session. 
So you were created for pleasure, you were created for joy, and you were created for holiness. And you probably believed that, but what I, what, I, what I want you to notice is the second part of what I've written here. You were created for pleasure, for joy, and for holiness, and these are not different things. God takes pleasure in your God-honoring pleasures, and God takes great joy in your God-honoring joys. When you are at your happiest, God is thrilled. When you are at your most joyful, this brings God, the glory of God, in the words of the Westminster uh, Confession, the glory, the, the, what is the chief end of man? The, the, the chief end of man is to know God and to enjoy Him forever. One of the early Christian fathers, his name escapes me right now, said, the glory of God is man fully alive. The glory of God is seen when mankind is fully alive and enjoying all of the pleasure and joy and happiness and connectivity that comes from this beautiful, amazing thing that we call life when it's at its best. Now, I know that everybody in this room knows sorrow as well. You know tragedy as well. You know depression as well. You know disappointment as well. You know failure as well, as do I. But is it not the case that the sorrow that we feel today is simply the absence of the happiness that we felt in the past? Isn't it true that in some significant sense, the only reason that we know sorrow is that we've known happiness? The uh, Lebanese prophet Khalil Gibran famously said that the well of our, or the waters of our happiness are only as deep as the well of our sorrows. We can know it beautiful because we've known it sad and, and, and bad. Now, who better to fulfill your desires and my desires than him who made the heart to desire itself? God made your heart with all of the desires, with all of the passions, with all of the longings that you have. And who better to fulfill the longing desires of your heart than him that made your heart to desire in the first place? There's this great text of scripture found in one of the minor prophets where God's Messiah, Jesus, is referred to as the desire of all nations. The Messiah is the desire, the longing, the craving of all nations, of every human heart. The answer is yes. Look at Psalm 16, verse 11. You will show me the path of life, says the psalmist. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. God is not a killjoy. God is not down on human pleasure. In fact, God is way up on human pleasure. God created you to experience pleasure. In fact, the Garden of Eden, Genesis 1 and 2, the word Eden means pleasure. It's what the word means. God took Adam and, his Eve, Adam and Eve, his son and his daughter, and he placed them in the garden of pleasure. And he said, of every tree you may freely eat. God gave them opportunity to engage in all of the various trees that were there. As we've already mentioned, he made the social sexual interaction, the, the, the lovemaking, life-giving uh, connection between a man and a woman, a highly wonderful and pleasurable experience. God created those things. He made those things because he takes great pleasure in our pleasure when they are God-honoring pleasures. They bring him happiness and joy. You were made for pleasure, and God takes pleasure in all of your God-honoring pleasures. So that's reason number one. Life is awesome when it's at its best. Okay, here's reason number two. Reason number two to believe that God is good is that universally we crave meaning, goodness, and joy. This is not a David Asherick thing. This is not a Colorado thing. This isn't an American thing. This is a universal human experience. We crave meaning. We, we want our lives to matter, and every one of us in this room to some degree believes that your life matters. That, that you, you, we have a sense almost that there's a movie that's taking place behind our eyes. And there's, and you know, and there's a movie, and we see ourselves in, in some sense as playing a part, uh, large or small, in this grand reality that's taking place in the world. We, we intuit that our life has meaning. Uh, every Hollywood movie, or not every, the vast majority of Hollywood movies communicate to us what we know intuitively, that, that your life has some kind of meaning, that there's, that there's purpose, right? I'm talking about the best of Hollywood movies, not the, not the junk. And we crave goodness and we crave joy. Most of us in this room would self-identify as good people or we would identify as people that want to be good people. It's a natural human desire to want to be the best versions of ourselves and we long for joy. Now, I want to share with you a quotation that's a little challenging it's one of my all-time favorite quotations. It's only the second time I've ever shared it in a sermon because it's a little heady, but I figured what a great opportunity to share it. So if you get it, great. If you don't, just wake up in about 120 seconds. This is from Simon, uh, Simone Weil. She's a French Christian philosopher uh, who lived in the early 1900s, and she writes, In the period of preparation, the soul loves in emptiness. 
It does not know whether, whether anything real answers its love. She's describing the experience of the person who is not yet connected with God. And in that period of preparation before we come to God, the, the, the soul loves, it longs to love and be loved, but it does so in emptiness without any fundamental or foundational connection. And she says, the soul does not know whether anything real answers back in that love. Right? She continues, it, it may believe that it knows, but to believe is, is not to know. Such, the, such a belief does, does not really help. The soul knows for certain only that it is hungry. Now we're going to see this is the very analogy that Jesus himself used. The soul knows that it is hungry. The important thing is that the soul announces this hunger, this longing, this craving by crying. And every one of us in this room knows that feeling. That feeling of longing. Why am I here? Why did I treat the person that way? We, we crave meaning and we crave an answer. We, we want God and we want to know that he's there. The important thing is that it announces its hunger by crying. A child does not stop crying if we tell it that there is no bread. The child's crying. child's hungry. And we say, well, there's no bread. Oh, there's no bread. I'll stop crying. No, the child continues to cry because the hunger is real. It goes on crying just the same. The danger is not lest the soul should doubt whether there is any bread, but lest by a lie the soul should persuade itself that it is not, in fact, hungry. It can only persuade itself of this by lying, for the reality of its hunger is not a belief. It's a certainty. You see what she's on to here? She's on to this reality that we know at our most fundamental level, we long for something bigger than ourselves. We long for beauty. We long for joy. We long for meaning. We long for purpose, and we know it. And when our lives fall short of that ideal that we want to attain to, we feel a sense of, of crying. Now, not everybody does this because nowadays we're so distracted with Facebook and social media and television and computers that we don't even, we've lost the art of reflection and self-reflection. And, but in those quieter moments, back before the advent of televisions and smartphones that are making dumb people, we, there were opportunities to sit and reflect on the nature of life and to not be uninterruptedly distracted by a thousand pictures and a thousand posts and a thousand things that are calling for our attention. Okay? And what Wheel says here is so true. In those quieter moments when we are falling short of the grand ideal of a true soul connection with God, we know that we hunger and thirst. How did Jesus say it? Hunger and thirst for rightness, for holiness, for goodness. The God that our heart craves is the very God that Scripture reveals. Well, isn't that a happy coincidence? The very God that our heart longs to be real, that we hope is real. In the words of my good friend Ty Gibson, the longing desire of every human heart is to be fully known and yet fully loved. And this is what we wrestle with. Because most of us operate under the assumption, whether or not we would ever say so or not, that if we were fully known, we could not be fully loved. But what do we do with the God of Scripture who knows us exhaustively and loves us completely. To be fully known and fully loved, if that were true, would be the greatest of all possible joys and pleasures. I want to say that again. To be fully known and yet to be fully loved would be the greatest of all possible joys and pleasures. Yes? The very God that we want to exist, the very God that our heart cries out for, does exist. And not only does he exist, he's revealed in scripture as amazingly good. And of course, it just stands to reason because the God who created our heart created, as Augustine said, in our hearts, a God-shaped void, a, a void that cannot be filled with alcohol or entertainment or, or illegitimate relationships. It can only be filled with the one who made the whole himself. And he made that whole in his own shape. Mm. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, Blessed are those, Jesus said, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. This is the very point that Simone Weil was making. The soul hungers, but what is it hungering for? It's thirsting. Jesus purposefully doesn't say here, you know, this is academic, this is intellectual, this is cerebral. No, Jesus uses something that's more visceral than that. It's more uh, to hunger. I mean, how, how, how do you know when you're hungry? You just know it. Your, your body begins to say, hey, look, there's a, there's a vacancy here. There's a need here. We need something. And in the same way, there's a vacancy in us. And we say, hey, I need something. I'm hungering and I'm thirsting. What, what is better in life than when you're really thirsty 
and you get to drink cold water or some cold beverage or refreshment. Man, you're in Colorado. Man, the beer companies, make, they make millions of dollars off of selling that imagery. Now, I don't know how anybody can actually enjoy beer, but people apparently do. But, but the whole idea that when you're super thirsty, you just want to slake that thirst with something cold and refreshing. Are you with me on that? just awesome. I can remember some of my best memories. I think I was severely dehydrated as a boy because I can remember some of my best memories were making it to the water fountain after recess as a boy and just like looking at the water fountain and be like, this is going to be so good. <laughs> Does anybody else have that experience? I think I was just hugely severely dehydrated. And when I'd get there, I couldn't swallow hard. I was like, ugh, 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 ugh. I mean, just, just like forcing it in, and I just stay at that fountain. And I remember kids used to say to me, hey, save some for the fish. You know, just like, ah. Oh. John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Does, your, does our heart hunger for something of sustenance? It does, of course. Our heart hungers. In the words of G.K. Chesterton, I love this. He says, the purpose of an open mind is very similar to the same, is very similar to the purpose of an open mouth, to close around something solid. Right? We, we, we hunger and long for something substantive, something solid. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. When Jesus finds his place in that God-shaped hole, that, that vacuum in our heart, we become fully alive. We become the people that we were created and saved to be. And it's a beautiful, happy thing. And it's an evidence that God is good. Number three. Our reality, the reality that we exist in, is compellingly explained in the context of these three words that God is love. Now, I'm going to explore this in depth in our second presentation tomorrow, but I'll give you a quick introduction. Here are things that we take for granted intuitively. If your brain is working correctly and you are alive and breathing, then you take these things for granted. You don't have to be taught them. From a child, you begin to intuit them. Individuality, you knew that you were not your brother, you knew that you were not your sister, you knew that you were not your parents. You, you're, you, the most fundamental reality to human experience is that you are an entity, right? Th this goes back to Rene Descartes when he was beginning to wonder what we could firmly base a philosophical system on, and he finally famously said, I think, therefore I am. When you reduce life back to its most fundamental axiom, every one of us knows that we are an individual and that we are not somebody else. You are who you are and you are no one else. Our individuality is something that we cannot not, it's something that you can't, you, 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 it's impossible to not imagine it. And let me give you an illustration. I'm not doing a good job here. You cannot imagine your own funeral. Okay? Has anyone here ever tried to imagine their own funeral? I mean, most people have. Okay, I have. The problem is, is that you're, it's not real. You're not actually able to do it because you're there seeing it, right? You cannot imagine your own non-existence because you're there imagining it. You follow? So, so, so the idea of your non-existence is something you can't even conceive of. The only sense in which you can conceive of your non-existence is if you think about the past, you can, you can imagine times that you, I certainly didn't exist at the time that Alexander the Great existed. I, I know that. But here I am aware of the fact that I never existed in the time of Alexander the Great. It's impossible for David Asterisk or anybody to get around the, the most basic notion of our, of our existence and our fundamental individuality. Coupled with the second most fundamental thing to us, and that is freedom. And, and children know very early on, and mothers figure out very early on, as do fathers, that, that children know what they want, even if they can't communicate it very well. They know what they want, and they're going to do whatever they can within their little sphere of influence, whether it's, you know, two months or two years, to get what they want. Am I wrong or am I right? So before a child can ever say anything, communicate in language, he or she understands freedom intuitively, incorrigibly. A child understands natively, hey, I want whatever that is. I want to do this. And if you, if you make a child do something they don't want to do, they understand that their freedom is being restricted and they don't like it. Now, you and I, we're no longer children, but we know this, and this is easily illustrated. If, you and, if I was just walking down the street, or you were walking on the street. Just imagine you're walking on the street, any street, anywhere. And somebody reaches out to you, walking, you know, say somebody's coming at you. And as you walk by, they reach out to you and start with force, with strength. A man, a grown man, grabs you and starts pulling you in an, against your will, starts pulling you in an opposite direction. You won't think, you know, this is, I don't want this. I don't, 
not really wanting to go with this strange bearded man in a stinky flannel shirt, I, um, I think I'm going to resist now. No, you will, before you ever entertain any ideas about the nature of your freedom and where this guy is taking you, you will instinctively resist. Y you follow that? Because you know intuitively that to, to have your, fr your freedom impinged upon is something you don't like. When we punish criminals, how are criminals usually punished? by the restriction of their freedom. Because we understand that to limit somebody's freedom is to take away in some sense their personhood, to take away in some sense their individuality, to in some sense take away the thing that makes them human. Are you with me on that? And so number one, your individuality, number two, your freedom, and number three, love. And I'm gonna really talk about that tomorrow, so I'm gonna skip over that. I'm gonna skip over risk because I'm gonna talk about that tomorrow, and number four, or number five, meaning I've already talked about. These are things that we take for granted. We just assume these basic realities about our life, individuality, freedom, love, risk, and meaning. We'll pick it up tomorrow. In the words of Lewis, again, to, be, to love at all is to be vulnerable. And by the way, that is true whether you are a human or God. That is true even for God. I'm going to talk to you a little bit tomorrow about a book I'm reading right now, a brand new book just published 2015 by a man named Dr. John Peckham. And he wrote a book called The Love of God, a Canonical Model. Mind-blowing, Seventh-day Adventist scholar, mind-blowing book. And uh, one of the things that he's exploring in this book is the, the intrinsic vulnerability that is part of loving, not only to humans, and every one of us in this room, if you've ever had your heart broken, you've ever been betrayed, you ever had a child lie to you, we know that the moment we extend ourselves in love, there is an inherent and essential vulnerability that comes with that love. Are you with me on that? And what, what, what Peckham brings out, what Lewis brings out here, is that that's true for God too. God is making himself vulnerable in love. And you'll see this at the end. I've got to hurry up. Love anything, says Lewis, and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping your heart intact, you must give your heart to no one. Don't give your heart to anyone. Here's, here's how you keep your heart intact. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock your heart up in a safe in the casket of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, your heart will change. But it will not be broken. It will become unbreakable. It will become impenetrable. It will become irredeemable. You see, the only way to protect your heart from vulnerability is to create a situation where your heart becomes something it was never created to be, and that is stony and, and not extending. There is a, there's an inherent strength and yet an inherent vulnerability in love and reaching out to someone else. And Scripture communicates this in three basic ideas. In fact, these are the three basic ideas that are foundational to the whole Bible. People say to me, what's the Bible about? And there's a couple different ways to answer that question. There's two answers I like to give when people say to me, what is the Bible about? One answer I like to give is, the Bible is the story of God making promises to a man named Abraham and his descendants and then keeping those promises. That's the story of Scripture in a nutshell. God making promises to Abraham and his descendants and then keeping those promises. That's one way to say it. That's sort of the narrative way to say it. The thematic way to talk about what the Bible is is the three words that you see on the screen there. The Bible tells the story of creation, which we've been exploring in Genesis 1 and 2. It tells the story of conflict, which we're going to pick up tomorrow in depth. And it tells the story of covenant, which is simply another way of saying relational faithfulness. That there was creation, that there was conflict, and there is relational fidelity. That God has, in an act of inherent vulnerability, extended himself. As we learned last night from Alvin Plantinga, the gospel is not just a nice story. Plantinga said, it's the most beautiful story that could ever be told. And remember, I gave you homework. Try to imagine a better story. There isn't one. You cannot conceive of a better story than the story that Scripture tells, which is the basic story of God giving himself. And we're going to see this in just a second. I've got to hurry this up. Reason number four. Jesus came from God and is God, and he's really awesome. Sometimes you just got to say it like it is. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus said, If you have seen Me, you have seen the Father, Jesus Christ. As I mentioned last night, if God looks like Jesus, that's really good news. If God looks like somebody who finds a woman who was caught in the act of adultery and who says to her, I do not condemn you, go and sin no more, he sees a future for her, he sees a possibility for her that she cannot even see for herself. If God will sit down with a publican, a tax collector, if God will sit down with a Pharisee named Nicodemus and interact with him, if God will speak to a hated 
publican named Zacchaeus and go eat dinner at his house, if God will speak to a Roman centurion who was hated because he was a Gentile, doubly hated because he was a Roman, triply hated because he was a Roman soldier, and quadruply hated because he was a leader of soldiers, if Jesus can say to this guy, I've not seen so great faith in all of Israel, if God looks like that, that is really good news. In fact, it's the greatest conceivable good news. And as I mentioned last night, can you think of a better, more beautiful story? I'll answer that for you. The answer is no. Okay, number five. Now, I, I wish I had an hour to talk about what I'm going to talk about here in the next 10 minutes. 10 minutes. If my son was here, he'd be laughing his head off. <laughs> All right, now this is going to require a little bit of thinking. One of the reasons that we can be sure that God is good is that the gospel, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, is not a two-party, is a two-party arrangement, not a three-party arrangement. Okay, now you're sitting there going, you're making that face. You're making the... It's a little late for that, don't you think? Okay, let me explain what I mean by this. We just quoted John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's a verse that we all know and we all know well. But what do we do with this verse? Jeremiah chapter 19, 4 and 5. God says, speaking of Israel, they have forsaken me and they have made this, Jerusalem, an alien place. God's city, he says. It's an alien place. It's a foreign place. I come here, I feel like I don't even belong in my own city, my own town, among my own people. Well, why not, God? Why do you feel like a foreigner in your hometown? Well, because they have burned incense in it to other gods whom neither they nor their fathers nor the kings of Judah have known, and they have filled this place with the blood of innocents. More specifically, what do you mean? Verse 5, they have built the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings to Baal, which I did not command or speak, neither did it come into my mind. Now, let me just tell you what's going on here. In the ancient Canaanite religions, one of the ways that you could show your supreme devotion to the various gods of the Canaanite faith was by sacrificing your child, sacrificing your child to God. And God says, you know what? I came to, to my place, my city, my people, and I felt like a foreigner there because my own people began to participate in the actions of the Canaanites. They were offering their children as offerings. And he says, not only do I find that repugnant, not only do I find that absolutely disgusting and revolting, it never even came into my mind to ask for such a thing. Okay, but, but wait a minute. We just read a second ago that the good news is that God gave his son. But God here says, I never even imagined the idea of child sacrifice. So which is it? Which is it? Is it John 3.16 or is it Jeremiah 19? I mean, is the gospel the good news that God gave his son? as a sacrifice? Or is the idea of child sacrifice something that never even entered into God's brain? So repugnant, so disgusting that it never even came into his mind. What's going on here? Well, most of us would have a difficult time answering that question, but I want you to understand just how crucially important this question is. And it is proof positive that God is good. All of this, of course, takes us back to that primordial story that's found in Genesis chapter 22, where God said the unthinkable to Abraham, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. I want to tell you something right now. Every person in this room, I can basically guarantee you, if you thought that God was telling you to sacrifice your son, you would not do it. I can, I can assure you I would not. If I had a voice that came to me that said to me, hey, go kill Landon, go sacrifice Landon, I would not do it. And I am 99% sure that no father or mother in this place would do it. Which raises the question, why was Abraham willing to do something that I wouldn't even consider? And here's why. Because in Abraham's cultural context, namely in the land of Canaan, this was the way that God, op this, this was the way that God's operated. I mean, if you really wanted to be devoted to God, you would bring a small offering. If you wanted to be super devoted, you increase the size of that offering. If you wanted to be supremely devoted, maybe you bring your best goat or your best cow or your best sheep, whatever it is. But what if you really, really, really want to show your devotion to a God? Well, that next logical step would be taken by the Canaanites, and they would offer not just their livestock, but their offspring. Now, it's a seemingly logical step, except that God says, I find that disgusting and repulsive and I never ask you to do such a thing, so much so that it never even came into my mind. So why is God asking Abraham to do something that he says never even came into his mind because he finds it so revolting and he finds it so revolting that he says when he comes to his people, he's a foreigner or an alien? Well, here's why. 
Abraham lived in a time, in a situation, and in a culture where this was the very kind of thing that God's asked people to do. Take your son and kill him. Show your real devotion to me. Show your real loyalty to me. Show your real obedience to me. And so Abraham, who has been in a covenantal relationship with God for years at this point, he would have scratched his head and said, man, I, 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 I guess I thought this God was different. But I guess not. Come on, Isaac. Let's go. And he begins to lead him through that three-day journey on his way to Mount Moriah. And all the while, all the while Mo, Abraham is trying to make sense out of this seemingly incongruous command. God appeared to be good. He appeared to be kind. He promised descendants. Of course, there was the whole logistical nightmare of how am I going to have descendants if I'm killing the only you know, legitimate offspring that I have? There's all of that going on. And as they're making their way up the mountain, Isaac, young boy, probably not more than 14, somewhere between 14 and 17, he asks his dad a question. He says, hey, dad, there's the wood. Where's the lamb? Where's the animal for the sacrifice? And Abraham preaches the gospel and he doesn't even know it. He says this, my son, God will provide, for a, God will provide the lamb for a burnt offering himself. Abraham doesn't know he's saying the gospel. He's just trying to delay. He's stalling. He doesn't know what to say, frankly. Uh, God will take care of this. God will provide the lamb for a burnt offering himself. But here's a remarkable thing. Keep a close eye on that screen because I'm going to insert a comma. And when I insert this comma, it is going to make the gospel-centered nature of this passage come alive for those of you that, that are really tuning in here. Watch this comma. My son, God will provide the lamb for a burnt offering himself. At just that moment on top of Mount Moriah, there was a ram that was caught in a thicket in the bush and the ram was slain and Isaac was spared. In a significant and wonderful way then, Isaac does not really represent Jesus. He represents us because we're spared and the ram represents Jesus. In answer to the question, hey, dad, where's the ram? Where's the lamb? Where's the animal? Abraham said, God will have to provide this. God will provide a lamb himself. You see, friends, it looks like this. Which of these is the gospel? Is the gospel on the right or on the left? Is, is, the, is the gospel a three-party arrangement? God, Jesus, and sinners or is the gospel a two-party arrangement? God and sinners. Now, let me just unpack that for you. Some of us have in, the mind, in our mind an idea that, though we might not articulate it this crudely, I'll give you the basic picture. We have this idea that God is upset. God is angry. He's wrathful against sin, and he's wrathful against evil, and he's going to pour out his wrath and his anger and his judgment on evil and sin. And because we are evil and we are sinners, God is going to pour out his wrath on us. But at just that moment when God is about to do that, someone else steps into the picture and says, no, no, I'll do it. And God's like, all right, well, I really want to pour out my wrath on them, but in Instead, I'll pour out my wrath on you, and my wrath and my anger will then be placated, and I will have cooled down so I don't have to take it out on them. This is a three-party arrangement. There's God, Jesus, and sinners. And God's initial wrath was on sin, sinners, and evil, but he redirects his wrath over to this third party to protect, or to the second party to protect the third party. I'm going to tell you right now, that is not the gospel. And not only is that not the gospel, that's not even good news. That's terrifying. It's, it's terrifying to think that, 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 that people conceive that is the essence of the gospel, that God is going to give somebody else a good whacking when he really wants to whack those people. No, 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 no. The gospel is not a three-party arrangement. The gospel is a two-party arrangement. You see, friends, Jesus is God. If, if, there's any, if, if it's anybody other than God hanging on that cross, that's not good news. The good news is that God himself, not some other party, God himself took the penalty and the consequence of sin upon himself to preserve those who were undeserving and who were in rebellion against him. You see, friends, the gospel isn't three. The gospel is two. And if Jesus isn't God, the gospel isn't good news. It's child sacrifice. That's what's happening in Jeremiah 19. In Jeremiah, ni Jeremiah 19, where God says, this never even came into my mind, that's one party sacrificing a second party to a third party. And God says, I don't think so. I don't think so. That's disgusting to me. 
The truth is, is that there's only two parties in this arrangement. There's God and there's sinners. And God in the person of his son, Jesus, who is fully and completely God, in, in, the, in the most emphatic sense of what it means to be God, he laid down his own life. In fact, Jesus said it this way, no, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down myself. I like to ask the question, who killed Jesus? Did the Romans kill Jesus? Did the religious leaders of Jesus stay kill Jesus? Did our sins kill Jesus? The answer is none of the above. Jesus laid down his own life. He said, no one can take my life from me. I lay it down voluntarily and I take it up again. He was not a third party or a second party that was sacrificed to appease. He was one of only two parties. There was God and there was sinners. And God took upon himself in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, who was fully God, the consequences of our sin and our rebellion. And that is really, really, really good news. Greater love has no one than this, and a man, than, than someone would lay down his life for his friends. The text doesn't say, greater love has no man than this, and a man would lay down the life of his friend. Oh, it was a wasp? Yeah. Oh, man, just like the enemy. <laughs> greater love has no man than this, and a man would lay down his life for one of his friends. All right, you made it. No, seriously, can you think of a better story than that? You can't. Reason number one, he created the universe and our world, and he made them very good. Number two, universally, we all crave meaning, goodness, and joy. We intuit this. We know this from, from the outset of our lives. We long for meaning. We long for joy. We long for freedom. Number three, our reality is compellingly explained in the context of God is love. I'll unpack that more fully in our session tomorrow, uh, the second session. Reason number three, uh, Jesus came from God, and he is God, and this is really good news because Jesus is super cool and awesome. And number three, the gospel is not a, two par uh, not a three party arrangement. The gospel is a two party arrangement where God himself takes upon himself the responsibility of our sin. I can only say with Paul, for I am convinced that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And final slide, that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width. Get out of here. <laughs> what? Well, uh, it's like coming forward for an altar call here. What are you doing? <laughs> here he comes. Get behind me, wasp. Oh, he's coming back for more. I never had this happen before. I've had some weird things happen in my meetings, but never this. Okay, anyway, where was I at? What is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ? And I love this, which passes knowledge. I've done my best tonight in a long time. You've been very generous to communicate to you with, with my intellectual capacities and my research, things that I find really compelling. But at the end of the day, Paul says, this love, this kind of love that we're talking about, it cannot be quantified in words. It cannot be quantified in academics. It cannot be quantified in knowledge. It passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. It's been great to be with you. Let me close with prayer. Father in heaven, beautiful people in this room, uh, and, and yet, we are people broken. And, um, but in our brokenness, Father, as we've mentioned here, you love us. You know us perfectly and love us genuinely. And Lord, this is an astonishing thing. It's a thing that we can scarcely come to grips with. And uh, tonight, I just want to pray for every person here, for that person that's suffering, struggling, wondering, doubting. Um, Father, just give them a sense that life is a beautiful, meaningful thing that you have created for good and that you want them to be a part of that. Whether small or great, Father, help us to be that puzzle piece, that uniquely shaped piece in this grand painting that you're, that you're creating that only we can fill. And Father, help us to do that. And we look to you. We love you. But we know, Father, that that's not the big story. The big story is not our love for you, but your love for us. And uh, send us home tonight, hearts full with the breadth, height, width, depth of the love of God, the fullness of God shown to us in the man Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, nine o'clock, not bad, not bad. Ah, we're good, we're good, we're good. It'll be better tomorrow morning. You'll be out of, I, let me make a promise, uh -oh. I make a uh -oh. solemn promise. <laughs> Tomorrow, I will have you out of here by 8.30 p.m. <laughs> I think he's good for his word on that one. I think he's good for his word. Um, how many of you have been enjoying the meeting so far? How many of you would like to do better on the quiz next time? Okay, I'm going to tell you how you can do that. Um, 
Last night's programs are already up on our church website. It's franktownsda.org, and you can listen to them on there. Um, but we are also going to make available to you the video presentation or the audio presentation, which, whichever you would like, of the whole series. Um, you may have noticed that we have an awesome audiovisual crew who's been here each night. They'll be, they've been filming and recording the audio as well. And if you would be interested in having a copy of this and us sending this copy to you at the end when it's all said and done, right on the back, two tables where you had your snack in between the two meetings. Um, there are pens and paper, pen and paper, and you can fill out a, um, a short little piece of paper, and we can then send you the final copy, whichever you would like, audio or a DVD series um, that you can have so you can have it at home or you could share it with somebody who might enjoy the series as well. So on your way out, please take a moment, just head over to the table, fill out the information there, and we will be happy to share this with you so that you can do better on further quizzes later on at the beginning of our programs. Um, but you can check the, uh, the first two are already up on there. Thank you so much for coming. We'll see you tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock and then 11.15 for part number two. Have a great evening and a safe trip home.